Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 16th, 2010. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby, editor of Brew Your Own Magazine, and I get back to some of the basics of all grain brewing as we talk thermal mass and slaking heat. What are they? And how do they affect me? I mean you. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. On Twitter, I am Basic Brewing, all one word. On Facebook, I'm f- uh, at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page on Facebook, which I'll be mentioning in just a second, is facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we appreciate your generous support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. And our, uh, our iPhone app is in the iTunes store, and for you BlackBerry users, You can find us in the BlackBerry podcast directory, too. I want to start off this week with a letter from Dave, originally from Oklahoma City, but now he's in Afghanistan. He's been serving there for six months, and he'll be returning home in in just a few weeks, just in time for brewing season. But Dave's got a quandary that he'd like some help with. Dave says, unfortunately, I haven't been able to brew lately because I was deployed to Afghanistan in April. But after six months away from home and beer... I'm only four weeks from coming home. So naturally, these last few days have been racking my brain, instead of racking his beer, I guess, wondering what my first meal will be, what movie I'll watch first, and, of course, what my first homebrew will be. Dave says, now I'm a sucker for seasonal brews, and I love full-bodied beers, so I was thinking something along the lines of a Dunkel Whiteson or maybe an American Wheat. I want to call it Second Honeymoon Ale on account of me missing our second wedding anniversary while in Afghanistan. But the problem is, I've been away from decent food and beer so long, I've lost my palate and all my culinary imagination. I can't wait, or I can't for the life of me, come up with a recipe worthy to toast with my better half on Thanksgiving. So, uh, Dave has sent some notes on what kind of beer he'd like to brew and some of the ingredients that he's thinking of using, but he wants some help. Finishing out the details of the recipe. So, what uh, I think we need to collaborate. Bring uh, all the the Facebook users and uh, listeners to this podcast together uh, to help Dave come up with a recipe. What I've done is I've posted his note in its entirety on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. And what I'm hoping is that you out there will write in the comments field under the note, to give Dave some ideas, and in the meantime, give him a connection to the brewing community while he's in Afghanistan. Dave does have access to Facebook, and he can read your comments and reply to them. So what do you think? Are you up to the challenge? I think you are. Check out the page, read Dave's note, and reach into your recipe file for some suggestions on a Thanksgiving beer for Dave and his family. Uh, On another note, uh, Andy and I are headed to Denver for the Great American Beer Festival, and we may already be there by the time you hear this. In connection with the Great American Beer Festival, I got a note from Christopher up in Connecticut about a a fun and worthy event to check into. Christopher says, For the second year, All About Beer Magazine and Wincoop Brewery are hosting the Denver Rare Beer Tasting to benefit pints for prostates in their efforts to increase awareness uh, awareness of uh, prostate cancer. Uh, I know that PFP founder Rick Like would greatly appreciate any additional PR you would be able to provide prior to this event through your podcast. Not not as prior <laughs> as I would like, because the thing is on Thursday, uh, I'm recording this on Wednesday and posting it on Wednesday, but uh, it's tomorrow. Sorry about that. Uh, as a recent prostate cancer patient, uh, Christopher says, and a longtime listener, I'd appreciate it too. Well, good. I, I am, am I'm happy to do it. He says, also, L.D. Carlson Company created a special PSA IPA. PSA, I would imagine, stands for the PSA test that you uh, can take to help detect uh, prostate cancer. 
He says they're they're selling a uh, L.D. Carlson company created a special PSA IPA to help raise awareness about prostate cancer. The company is donating $3 from every kit sold to the Pints for Prostates campaign. Some of the homebrew stores selling the ingredient kits have pledged to match the donation. So thanks, Christopher. You may have already heard of Pints for Prostates, but if you haven't, check out their website at pintsforprostates.org. And if you miss this event, uh, there will be others that you can find out and support. So check that out and get yourself checked out, too. Here's a follow-up from Kevin, who had the less serious problem uh, with aphid-infested hop cones. He used a trick that he learned from camping involving yellow jackets and dish soap dissolved in water. Here's, here's Kevin's solution. He says, I've filled some Tupperware with water and soap, soaked the hop cones for about 15 minutes, long enough to ensure the aphids would buy the farm, poured the water and cones out into a colander, and voila, no aphids. And I could still see plenty of the yellow stuff on the cones. Hard to say if I lost some lupulin in the process or not, but straight observation tells me it was a small amount. Certainly better than chucking out the infested cones. And Kevin did say that he he rinsed the soapy solution off the cones after soaking. Uh, Then I got this from Andrew in the U.K. He said, uh, I have just picked my hops grown in my garden in Liverpool, U.K., and I have the same problem. I have put the hops in bags made from newspaper and hung them from the roof of my shed with a fan and dehumidifier to dry them off. The bags are in the dark and are left open. They also have numerous holes made with a hole punch. Consequently, the morning after they were put in the shed, most of the insects that had made their home in the hops had scuttled away. The aphids had settled on the paper at the opening of the bag. It was only a small task to take my fingers over them to kill them. They had really made it easy by collecting tightly together. So there you go. That's a fairly uh, fairly low-tech uh, way to take care of the aphids on the hops. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate the advice. By the way, I did reply to uh, to your email, but you didn't get it because my reply went to another Andrew with your same name who lives in South Africa. Uh, <laughs> he was a bit surprised to hear from me. He said he didn't have problems with aphids on his hops, but they were the aphids were attacking his celery in his garden. Uh, I think that's about the first wrong number that I've had uh, through email. It's, it's always <laughs> it's, it's always it's always fun to have a surprise through the email. So uh, if you if you send me a note via the contact form on our site at basicbrewing.com, please. Be sure to check the spelling on your email address so uh, I'm not accidentally contacting somebody half a world away from where you are. Okay, it's been a while since we checked in with Chris Colby of Brew Your Own Magazine. He and I and one of his cats sat down for a chat about some of the temperatures involved in all grain brewing. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hello, James. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been a long time. We've pretty much taken the summer off from yeah <laughs> from talking to each other. Uh, what with we we took a month just from uh, off from doing the podcast altogether, uh, and then you were out of pocket and I was out of pocket, and so mm-hmm. now we're back in pocket. Here we are, brass in pocket. There's a song in there somewhere. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, mash temperatures, or at least. Uh, starting mash temperatures, the strike water temperature. Um, a lot of people obsess about strike water temperature, don't they? Yeah, it's uh, all grain brewing. It's one of the sort of technical, uh, you know, it's one of the things you can measure. And a lot of people are, you know, a lot of all grain brewers want to, you know, on, on brew day, be able to just pour the strike water in, stir it up and have their mash come right to their, their target temperature and that that doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> now, why should should brewers be concerned about their strike water temperature? I mean, what does it matter what temperature you mash your grain at? Well, different uh, you know different mash temperatures yield uh, different sort of viscosities of wort or whatever. Generally, uh, or not generally, but in, in reality, uh, if you mash it at a lower temperature within the sort of you know normal window of temperatures you get 
uh, a more highly fermentable wort. Whereas if you mash at the higher end of the range, you know, usually, you know, 148 to 162, or sometimes it's quoted as a little bit narrower than that. But you know, generally in that range, if you're in the top end, you get uh, a wort that's less fermentable. Uh, so, you know, the flip side of that is that mash low and you get a final gravity that's low mash high and you get a final gravity that's that's higher you know um depending on you know then also your yeast and and some other variables but uh it generally affects how how fermentable your word is and that's one of the benefits of doing all grain is you can do some customization so you could see i guess why all grain brewers would be picky about that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and the strike water for those who who haven't gotten into all grain yet your strike water is the water that you initially put into your mash tun before you add your grain. Right. And you have to have your uh, strike water hotter than your infusion mash temperature because when you put the grain in the water, it's going to lower it quite a bit. Right, unless you're storing your grain at, at mash temperature, which you would never, ever do. <laughs> yeah, the... the the mat, stirring the grain into it is going to cool down the uh, is going to cool down the um, the strike water, and also when you if you heat up your your strike water say in a different vessel than your mash tun when you add it to your your mash tun uh, the temperature is also going to go down simply because the uh, your mash vessel is going to absorb some some heat as well. And you're probably pouring hot water through colder air, so you're mm-hmm. going to lose some some temperature there as well. Yeah, or it's going through, you know, sometimes it goes through, you know, thin tubing or or even a, a pipe. But, yeah, that that's going to radiate heat, too, from, you know, so your, your temperature of your strike water can, you know, change from the time it gets from your hot liquor tank to your, you know, uh, your mash tun. So typically, this, the stories I hear, when especially when people first start out all grain brewing, is that they have trouble hitting that initial... Uh, infusion rest temperature because their strike water was too cold or, or you know, rarely it's too hot because uh, it's easy to fix a, 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 a mash that's too hot. You just pour a little colder water in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're, if you're mashing in a, say, a Rubbermaid cooler like I've got, to raise your mash temperature, you're going to have to add boiling water to the mash tun and that takes time to to boil the water, and while the <laughs> while you're waiting for the water to boil, the uh, the the mash is resting at a lower temperature temperature than you want. So, yeah, it can be a source of stress on a brew day. Yeah, when you um, when you're working with a mash tun that's not heatable, yeah, I mean your strike water becomes your strike water temp becomes doubly important because you have limited you know ways to. Uh, ways to change it and there are there are always consequences like if you add boiling water um you know as you say there, there's also there, there's the heat time that it takes to boil that water if you if you don't have it on hand uh you're also diluting the uh the mash which depending on how full your mash tun is you might not be able to um another way if you're low in a non-heatable mash tun is is to pull a decoction scoop out some of the the mash itself and heat that up and, and restart in but that has the added consequence that you're you know you're boiling those grains and perhaps darkening them a little bit, but, you know, so deactivating some of those enzymes. And, uh, yeah, so when you're, when you're low, you've got a couple couple ways to bring it up if you can't directly heat the mash tun. And it's, it's just easier if you have figured out either numerically or by trial and error what your correct strike water temperature is. So, so let's, let's try to give some hints on, on how people can hit that target to begin with. Because even if you're pulling a decoction uh, or you're adding boiling water, you're adding cold water, you're, cha- you're deviating from your plan. And so you're, mm-hmm. you're not brewing the beer that you initially started out to brew. It may be a wonderful beer. It may be a better beer. But you're still devi- having to deviate from your, your plan. So let's talk about some ways that, um, that we can get people to the proper strike water temperature so that when they add their grains in, they're golden, they're perfect. Uh, and an article in the most recent issue of Brew Your Own Magazine is called Mass for the Mashes, Calculating the Temperatures for All Grain Brewing 
by Bill Pierce. And one of the things that Bill talks about is thermal mass. Now, what I mean, we've got thermal mass in several different areas in this equation, right? Yeah, the thermal mass is just, um, you can think of it a couple different ways. Um, one, and one way is, is just how much heat will a given uh, piece of, either piece of equipment or volume of water or, or you know, weight of grain hold, essentially. Um, or, you know, in the article, he defines it as how much temperature does it take to, to move uh, um something from uh, a, I'd have to look up the exact numbers but how to move it from one temperature to another um, yeah so and thermal mass comes in the uh, the article Bill wrote is this is the first of two parts and uh, the first part defines some of the things you're going to need to know and then in the, in the second part it'll be you know pulling it all together and how, how do you calculate mash temperature or, or you know strike water temperature on mash day and, and, and some other other things as well and going along that, we've got a letter from Dominic who says, uh, uh, I re- recently listened to one of the podcasts in the archives where you look at brewing apps, including various calculators, etc., and I'm currently thinking about how to obtain the thermal mass of my specific mash ton. Having studied chemistry at university, I know that I can work out the specific heat capacity of the entire mash ton by checking the temperature change of water over five minutes or so, but is there anything else that I need to be aware of when calculating thermal mass? How do most brewers calculate their specific thermal mass? I realize that a ar- large number of people won't bother as long as they hit the right mash temperatures, but I thought it would be a good question to ask. So how do most people figure out what the thermal mass of their mash ton is? Well, I would say most people probably don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have any idea of mine. Uh, I'm one of those as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, and we can talk about this later, but it's, it's so much simpler to do this all by, by just trial and error and mechanically. But um, to figure it out, uh, there, there's just a formula, and, and it's given in the, in the article. And essentially, what he's referring to and the, and the formula given in the, in the article are the, are the same thing. Um, basically, you, you measure the temperature of the vessel, um, you know, very carefully measure the temperature of the vessel, very carefully measure the temperature of the strike water. Then you pour it in, let it sit five minutes, uh, measure that temperature again, and uh, there, there's a formula that you plug it in, and that gives you uh, your vessel's thermal mass. And then that, that later um, you use it in calculations uh, to, to, to arrive at the right strike temperature. And the reason that, that he's asking probably is because he's been looking at something like ProMash, uh, which is a, an application, a PC application, uh, where it, it, asks for the, uh, it asks for the thermal mass of your mash ton when it is calculating what temperature your strike water should be. Uh, so that's one of the variables that you put in there. And if you, if you haven't done all grain brewing and you're looking at all these uh, variables on these calculators, it might be intimidating to say, oh my gosh, I don't know that part. You know, what do I do? So I guess right. your suggestion of trial and error is probably the, the best thing. Put in a an average value in that field and then see what your practical results turn out to be. Right. Um, and also one thing about ProMash, they have a, there's a, a value you can set for thermal mass there but it's not really thermal mass. It's it's like a uh, it's like a workaround that they use in the program. So it's um, like calculating thermal mass like the right way is going to give you a different value from from ProMash, and and you can't interchange those two. Um, yeah, and, and you know I would say that the nice thing about using um, you know uh, the equations to, to calculate your strike temperature and you know, especially if you go to the, the distance of calculating thermal mass, are that it lets you be flexible in in what you brew. If you brew, you know, a, a Berliner Weiss one day where, where you have just a tiny amount of grain because it's a low gravity beer, and let's say you brew five gallons of it one day, you know, and, and the net your next uh, beer is is uh, ten gallons of barley wine where you you know using way over you know probably four or five times as much malt. Uh, 
you know, and if, and and if you use different mash tons and different setups in your brewery, the nice thing about calculating everything is that you can be very flexible in you know, uh, uh, no matter what you encounter, you you know you can just plug into the formulas and get the uh, the reading out. Mm-hmm. The, the nice thing about doing it by trial and error is just that it, that it's very simply you, you simply you've calculated the values sort of mechanically is is a way to think about it. If you just you know the the first time you brew, if you just take um, if you just heat your your strike water to, you know, some sort of reasonable temperature, uh, you know, a lot of people use the figure of you know roughly ten or eleven degrees Fahrenheit above mash temperature seems to work out pretty good. Um, you know, if you if you do that, um, you know, do your first mash and check the temperature very carefully, like initially and, and five minutes later, then just look and see, you know, how how you're deviating from your mash temperature. And raise or lower the the temperature of your strike water the next time. Mm-hmm. You know, if you use the same brewing setup, if you if you're making beers of roughly the same gravity, if you're using uh, basically the same, you know, when the ballpark of the same mash thickness every time, uh, and then also presuming your your grain is stored at the same temperature and your your equipment's at the same temperature, um, you know, uh, you you can uh, do that by trial and error. Uh, the the downside of that is that, and again, where where people might want to rely more heavily on calculations, if you brew, say, outside, you know, and your brewing system sits, like, on a porch somewhere, uh, brewing in December is going to, you know, you're going to need a different temperature strike water than when you're brewing in July because, you know, your your system's just going to be warmer. Uh, mm-hmm. But for, you know, if, if, you're, if your grain temperature is relatively controlled, if you're, the temperature of your system is relatively controlled... Uh, you know, in that it doesn't vary a ton. Uh, doing it by trial and error is, you know, even for someone like me who's who's not math phobic, it's just so much simpler. And you know, uh, so why go through the hassle if you if you can hit your your mash temperature just by taking good notes a couple times? Mm-hmm. Now, there's one way that you can deal with thermal mass, and that is to knock it out of the equation altogether by warming up your mash ton. Yeah, that, and that's one thing a lot of home brewers do. Um, you know, you you find out when when you brew that uh, you know a lot, a lot of times you'll stir stir in your strike water into your grains or or your grains into your strike water depending on how you do it. And you know, a lot of times you'll you'll measure the uh, the temperature and it's like, hey, that's great. And then you'll come back five minutes later, measure it, and you know it'll have dropped a bunch. And uh, a way to get around that is uh, heat up. You know, maybe slightly more strike water than you than you're going to need to you know maybe 10 degrees above whatever your target mash temperature is, and just let it sit in your mash tun for a little while. Then you know drain it out, uh, and you know you can either uh, reestablish that the temperature of that strike water, or use other strike water, and put that in your you know put that into your mash vessel before it cools down. And yeah, you've essentially um, done away with uh having to worry about the, the the heat of your your mash ton because it's going to be right near uh right near your mash temperature here here's my little trick that i think i've i've talked about on the show maybe a couple times before uh but i found it so handy that i like to uh, share it a lot is i figure out the volume that i'm going to need for my strike water and i heat that volume up to say five or ten degrees higher than my target strike temperature. So in the summertime, maybe 5 degrees higher. In the wintertime, maybe 10 degrees higher because the mash tun is going to be a little colder. And then I take that volume and pour that into the mash tun, put the lid on, walk away, have a beer, let the temperature stabilize in there, let the water warm up that Rubbermaid cooler, and then I come back, and I, so I've got the volume that I need, and hopefully, I hope that it's still going to be a little hotter than I need. So what I do is I take a Pyrex mixing bowl, which has a handle on the side of it. It looks kind of like a giant uh, measuring cup, and it's got measurements on the side of it. So what I'll do is I will take cool water and put that uh, in there up to the half-gallon mark or two-quart mark. Forgive me, uh, metric people, <laughs> but that's the bowl I have. So I, I have this measured amount of cool water, 
And so I'll pour some water into the mash tun, stir it around, and I'll repeat this and, and take temperatures until I reach my perfect uh, strike water temperature. Now, the, the, the temperature is correct, but there's too much water in there as far as the volume is concerned. So what I'll do is just take the little pitcher and put it below the spigot and open up the spigot and drain out as much water as it takes to bring the volume in that measuring bowl up to the original uh, the original level. And so therefore, in my mash tun, I know that I have the perfect temperature and the perfect volume uh, for my strike water. And that works beautifully most of the time. And I don't know. I don't know if a lot of people do that, or if, or if this is something I stumbled on, or you know, everybody has their own little tricks and, and techniques. And I've passed that on to other brewers, and they say they've used it, and it works out great. So uh, that is a way that you can. Uh, it takes a, a little extra time than just figuring out exactly through a calculator the volume and the temperature that you'll need for it all to magically work together. Uh, in the end, but it's less risky uh, with missing the initial infusion mash temperature. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, I, do, I do something very similar, except I have a I have a mash tun that that I can actually heat, and I'll what I'll do is I'll heat um, because I can heat stuff faster in my hot liquor tank than in the mash tun. I heat most of the the uh, most of the uh, strike water in in the hot liquor tank and when it's getting close to temperature I, I start pumping it over to the the mash tun which I, which I heat then and, and use that to bring up the temperature the last couple degrees and then I shut off the shut off the burner and give it like five minutes because that lets whatever heat has been absorbed by the the brewing vessel sort of uh, you know uh, dispel and that that brings the you know uh, the water in the uh, in the mash tun plus the uh, the vessels uh, are at the same temperature. And then, you know, sometimes it might, after the burner's been turned off, you know, it might drift a little high, but then, like it said, like you said, all that evolves is, you know, add, add a little cool water in there, stir it around, let that uh, stabilize, and then you've got, you know, your your strike water is at the same temperature as your mash vessel, and that, that makes it much easier to, uh, if you're keeping track of, you know, if you keep track of, everything on on your brew day like your strike water temperatures your strike water volumes the amount of grain it lets you you know then you you'll you'll be very able to quickly come up with with the right temperature you need in strike water to hit your mash temperature because you've you've stabilized the both the strike water and and the the heat of of your system before you add in the grain so i think that we've uh, we've given some good suggestions of of hitting that initial infusion rest temperature because mm-hmm. that, that can be conf- that can be confusing and it can be frustrating if you're trying to hit especially if you've if you haven't brewed very many all grain beers before and you're kind of new to the system you're new to, to doing the whole thing there's so many uh, things to keep juggling in the air at the same time uh, and but once you get your process down things flow so much more smoothly Another thing that Bill talked about was slaking heat, which was a new one on me. Yeah, the idea of slaking heat is, um, well, it comes from, from the basic chemistry of what's happening in your mash tun. The, uh, the enzymes in, in the malt that, that break up the starch are what are called uh, or belong to a class of molecules called hydrolytic enzymes. And a hydrolytic just means basically... Uh, well, hydro is water, and lytic means breaking. So they they break bonds with water, and, and so what happens in starch? You've got uh, you know it's just a bunch of sugars connected by uh, chemical bonds, and what happens is these bonds, uh, with the help of the enzymes, get replaced with a, a water molecule initially, and then the uh, the sugars will break apart, leaving part of the the water molecule with one and and the other. You know, there's a, a hydrogen left with one and a hydroxyl group added to the other. So there's actually two sort of interesting brewing consequences to this is that technically since water is getting added uh, to to the starch, um, it, it's, it's technically possible, and, and I think it's even been achieved in some laboratory conditions, it's technically possible to get greater than 
mash efficiency. Hmm. You can get more sugar by weight uh, from your uh, from your grain than than the weight of the starch because the the you know the weight of the water being added to it uh, is enough to add up to to something. Um, but that's kind of that's not at all a practical concern to anybody, <laughs> and then you'd probably have to have a very accurate scale to to measure that. But uh, uh, the second consequence is that, and the one that Bill talks about in the article, is that when you add uh, when you break bonds hydrolytically, this is, or at least starch bonds broken hydrolytically, it's an exothermic reaction, meaning it gives off heat. And so when you mix, uh, you know, your grain and your, uh, and your strike water together, you know, most, most brewers tend to think of it, well, the grain's at a certain temperature and the, uh, water's at a certain temperature and, you know, they, uh, those two interact and, and the, the temperature evens out. But what's really going on is, is, is there, there's one extra quirk in there, uh, and that's that a small amount of heat is being added uh, uh, from the, the release of chemical or release of energy from, from breaking the chemical bonds. Hmm. And um, so from, from a practical standpoint, there's, there's nothing that you really need to do or adjust because that, that happens every time and you've just, you know, you, you just haven't noticed it. Um, but it's, it's an interesting concept. Uh, and, and, you know, just for, for advanced brewers who, who sort of want to know a little bit about the science behind it, the idea of slaking heat, I think, is is a little bit interesting. So this, it basically, we're getting a, a, a boost of heat from the chemical reaction that's going on in the mash. Right. Very, a very slight amount of help from uh, Mother Nature, I guess, <laughs> the laws of physics. It's not as it's not as apparent or not as obvious probably as as what you will see in the fermenter because you can actually see the yeah. you can see demonstrated in a in a more uh, evident effect uh, that the 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 temperature rises in active fermentation over right. the ambient room temperature you can have a stick on thermometer in your fermenter and actually see that. Um, and and that has some practical applications or practical considerations as well because it may have a uh, an impact on the character of your beer. Whereas this is kind of just a, an interesting bit of trivia, right? <laughs> right. You would, in fact, in order to, I mean, you could do an experiment to, like, if you were skeptical that that slaking heat existed, um, you could do an experiment. The you know the idea would be you'd want to to mash in and two different mashes, you know. Uh, same equipment, same strike temperature, same weight of grain, but you would want, in one of the cases, the malt not to have the enzymes that that would, you know, catalyze the reactions, and the other you would. So in the one you would uh, use just everyday, you know, normal good malt, and the other uh, either use you know malt that's you know 14 years old or something, and you've just dug up, <laughs> or or take take that same malt and like heat it. Uh, you know, in an oven, and then they'll let it cool back down to, to you know the normal temperature over overnight, and uh, you know mash mash two different mashes, one with one with live malt with uh, you know active enzymes in it, and one with uh, you know malt that that was inactive. And you could you know you could of course do a starch test to to at least uh, you know partially confirm that that mm-hmm. the one mash didn't work, and you'd have to check and then see that the temperature if there was a temperature differential. Between the two, and specifically if the uh, temperature was a couple degrees lower on the inactive malt, then that would indicate that that slaking heat was real. And uh, anyway, it's it's something that that brewers and brewing scientists feel is real, uh, but it, it's it's the sort of thing where the amount of heat generated by those reactions are not, you know, it's not not like you pour cold water in your mash and and then suddenly it you know rises up to 150 or anything like that. It's it's that you know it's it's maybe adding a degree or two hmm. and because most of us don't have uh, exceedingly well insulated uh mash vessels it's probably not going to be very uh consequential um, i mean we need all the help or at least i need all the help i can get especially in the in the fall and winter and, and maintaining my mash temperature um yeah, it's just something that it happens in every mash anyway. Uh, so you know you're not 
just recognizing that it's there is just uh, you know a bit of interesting chemistry that it's not simply the uh, diffusion of heat that that's leading to your final temperature, but it's the diffusion of heat plus a very very small amount of heat production from the uh, uh, from the hydrolysis reactions. So once we hit our strike temperature, and then we add our grain, and we're happy with our first infusion rest temperature we go away for an hour we come back Mm -hmm. we're going to lose some heat in the mash ton how how concerned should we be about that and what effect does that have on the mash and and it and at what point how much temperature would you have to lose to be really concerned that you need to do something about it well, that's a good question, especially at a homebrew scale. At the volumes we're using, uh, you know, with volume of beer we're making, uh, our mashes are fairly small, and they tend to, to shed heat pretty well. Um, you know, and depending on the type of mash tun you use, uh, you know, a lot of the, the picnic cooler uh, design mash tuns actually hold temperature, you know, incredibly well. Whereas if you've got stainless steel vessels, uh, you know, and especially in, in an environment that, that – you know, if it's cool outside when you brew, those can shed heat uh, pretty quickly. And, um, I mean, the consequence of the uh, temperature falling uh, is really something that, you know, it just, you're, you're falling into a zone where you're, where you're going to get uh, more highly fermentable uh, uh, wort. And, and, you know, that's not a bad thing, especially if you've, you know, if you brew your beer, uh, you know, taste it, and you know if you say, "Well, I'd like a little more body or whatever," raise the mash temperature up a little bit, and um, you know that's fine because uh, you know a lot of people think that the, the end all be all of mashing is to have an absolutely stable mash temperature from start to finish. But really, I would argue it doesn't matter if if your temperature dips a little bit. You know, if if it dips so in a in a predictable manner. And you know the outcome of it, you know. I mean, if you look at a graph, it doesn't really matter if you if your mass temperature is a straight line, you know, exactly horizontal, or one that dips a little bit, as long as that's reproducible for you and that you know what the consequences to your beer are. Um, so, and, and you know how 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 much temperature drop is too much is, you know, that's sort of something that that the brewer has to decide for himself. You're, you know, you're always going to have some. On a, on a homebrew, uh, you know, scale, and you know, it just depends on your own tolerance, and you know, critically tasting your beer. If you know, if all your beers end up, uh, say, too dry because you you can't, you know, your temperature always drops down too far, then then it's a problem for you. But if you are able to brew beers, you know, as fully bodied as you want, and then you know, there aren't any other problems. Uh, then, then you know it really doesn't matter what your temperature dropped during your mash was. If you know the, the final, the final, you know the reason you're brewing beer, hopefully, is is to make good quality beer, and you know the how you got there, you know doesn't matter. It, well, to me, it doesn't matter as much <laughs> as as actually getting there. You right, know, right? And then and then doubly so if you can get there repeatab- repeatably. You know, then uh, you know I would argue, and I'm sure some people would would not agree but i would argue that you know even if your mash temperature falls five degrees fahrenheit over an hour if it does you know if it's repeatable and you can get consistently brew the same beer with the same body and it and it's at you know a level of body that you like you know because the word fermentability is the same i I would say that was fine and we should mention that uh, you've been out of town recently and your cats are probably a little clingy (laughs) with <laughs> yeah. yeah they're uh they're incorrigible <laughs> but uh most of the work in the mash tun with the enzymes happens fairly quickly with today's right. malts right yeah especially if you're using u.s malts the diastatic power on those is is, is huge and so um basically one thing if, if you're if you're very worried about having an absolutely stable mash temperature and if you're using, you know, if you're using high amounts of US six row or US two row, um, just cut the mash short. You know, just mash for 
you know, 20 minutes is, if you're using American two row, is probably even overkill. Hmm. Um, wow. You know, uh, you can use a, an iodine test to be sure, but, you know, um, with a lot of, uh, you know, f- of basically a mash that's, that's mostly US two row and a little bit of crystal is going to be, you know, you don't know for sure, but uh, it could likely, but it could be done within five minutes. Wow. You know, um, yeah, seriously. Um, you can, you can, you can try that sometime. Just uh, take a little scoop, or you know, open up your, crack your valve a little bit during the mash, and take samples every five minutes, and do a little iodine test. And uh, you know, especially if you use the same malt over and over, you might want to do that just to give yourself an idea of when, when your mash is complete. And uh, yeah, there's nothing magical about mashing for an entire hour, you know, or you know, sixty and ninety minutes seem to be the the ones that show up in homebrew recipes over and over. But those aren't you know, magical times that correspond to anything wonderful happening in the word. It's just sort of a historical artifact that's, you know, people have been used to mashing for an hour, so they mash for an hour. I mean, I do it. (laughs) (laughs) And I know better even, you know, but I just say, oh, mash for an hour. (laughs) Well, it's a thing I think about uh, squeezing every last Show, you know, grain of uh, or molecule of sugar out of the mash tun. You know, there's something, something reassuring, or at least in my mind, that in, an hour seems like a really good length of time. And if I, you let it go an hour, yeah, I mean, you know, for one thing that that your mash is going to be complete. You don't have to have any worry whatsoever in your mind that that conversion is not complete. And yeah, it just you're going to any issues that you might have had with incomplete mixing of the mash. Or stuff like that that would lower your, uh, you know, lower your uh, yield uh, of sugars. You know, are, are done away by just time. You know, extra time. But it, in a, you know, if you've got a well mixed mash, and you, you know, you do an iodine test, you can just sit there and uh, pull a sample every few minutes, check it with the iodine test, and once you once you're clear, you know, uh, start running off. It seems like more work. <laughs> yeah, oh, it is. <laughs> or I even I, I've heard of people even they've um, this is on the professional side. They know how long it takes for conversion to happen, and they actually start running off before it's complete, with the idea that the rest of it will occur in the kettle because there's still, you know, as long as you haven't started heating it, and, and there's just a tiny little bit of time to go. The first bit you run off still has the enzymes that are in the wort, you know, and, and you keep running it in there, and, and the temperature. Even when you're heating, isn't going to, you know, go through the roof right away, uh, you know. So you can even start, uh, you can even start running off slightly before conversion is done and have the rest occur in your kettle. Yeah, or start certainly start vorloffing. Yeah, uh, take, uh, oh taking, yeah, definitely. taking word out of the bottom and adding it back to the top. I mean, it's still going to be in the mash tun. Uh, yeah, and so you could start even before your hour is up. You could start clearing your wort. With yep. a Vorloff and setting yep. your uh, setting your grain bed, and that way you'll be ready to hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that that home brewers do that um, it's not that they're wrong, but it's just that they're you know they're based on w- what we've always done and and it works, and you know and that's great because if you you know certainly if you've got a beer that you've you know you've brewed several times, you like it, it turns out how you want. There's there's really no reason to go and change your procedures just because you could do the mash, you know, mm-hmm. uh, short amount of time, or or this or that. If you're willing to, you know, if you're willing to sit around for an hour on uh, brew day and ha- have have the mash go that well, you know, that way, and you know your beer's going to turn out good, uh, you know, there's no reason that you should start experimenting with you know shorter mash times or you know starting to vorloff before you you've got conversion or anything like that. It's like you know. Uh, at least the way I tend to think of it is, you know, it's 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 how your beer ends up that's important, not the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the steps obviously uh, contribute to how your beer turns out, but for things that are otherwise equivalent, who cares? And uh, like I'm I'm so set in my in my method on a an all grain brew day usually that I've got stuff to do in that hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. You know? So that's that's nice because you can. It's the mash is also a a time where you know unlike the boil where you've got you know timed additions of hops and, and things 
the mash is something where if you need to let it go a little bit longer to, to do something, you know, it's not really going to hurt that much. Um, you know, you've mm-hmm. got, it's a bit of a, a stage where you've got a little bit of a, a s- some time to work with there. You can shorten it up if you want to get your brew day, day done fast. You can, you know, let it go a little bit long if you're still cleaning stuff or doing something, you know, grilling or something. Well, cool. Well, this has been fun, and I hope that uh, you, that people have have gotten some some tips and good information out of it. Because uh, especially when you first start getting into all grain, it's such a mysterious process. And you read websites, and you read magazines, and you watch DVDs, <clears throat> and uh, listen to <laughs> podcasts and such. And and there's such a, a wide range of information out there. And until you go through the process yourself. It is intimidating and it's scary and and you don't want to screw it up. Uh, so until you do a few batches and gain some confidence and realize that you don't have to follow everything to the letter all the time, uh, in the end you're you're going to get beer and it's probably going to be good beer. So uh, relax, right. one, don't worry, have a homebrew. One thing that. Uh like, you know, I wish someone had told me the the first few times I brewed is like, I, I would advise anyone who, who's just jumping into all grain on your first couple mashes, as long as, you know, you're going to have your target temperature, but whatever temperature it falls in, if, if it's anywhere within that window, just shut the mash on and call it good for that time. Mm-hmm. You're not, you're not completely going to wreck a beer. If you're, you know, if you're trying to mash high to get a big full body beer and, and you're on, on the low range, um, you know, just settle for that the first time because you're gonna your mash day your your, your brew day is gonna be so much more uh, you know stress free, um, and you know uh, also your beer you know people tend to think like oh it's off by a couple degrees it's gonna be ruined or whatever it's not it's just gonna be a little bit more fermentable or a little bit less fermentable and and, uh, and you're you probably can, not gonna tell the difference yeah and you're and another thing is like almost everybody you talk to. The, you know, their first uh, all-grain brew day, you know, people have stories about this went wrong and that went wrong and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, I mean, I spent, uh, like, a million different water additions trying to get the exact right temperature <laughs> when when I should have, you know, just left it because I was close enough on the first, you know, uh, try. But, you know, the thing is, you talk to almost everybody and, you know, they have this horror story about how everything went wrong. But then you ask them how the beer turned out and they're like, oh, pretty good. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've had stuck mash mashes that were so stuck that I had to take all the grain out and uh, sparge it through a spaghetti colander, uh, and the beer is fine. So, <laughs> so yeah, you can screw up in so many ways, and and the grain and the enzymes and the yeast and all the, they'll take care of you in the end. So, yeah, there's there's a, a definite forgivability factor built into the 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 mashing process that you know if if you if you mess up badly it's not probably going to be something that's repeatable for you that you can repeatably screw it up in that particular fashion and get the beer you want <laughs> but if you do screw up you, you can uh you know uh if you don't hit your mash temperatures correctly if it takes you a little while to to correct them generally you know uh beginning brewers should just relax a little bit and realize that everything is odds are going to be okay you know, you'll you'll get a decent tasting beer, probably a good one. Uh, you know, not just decent, probably a good tasting beer. It just might not be exactly what you were, you know, what you were shooting for. And there you know, go. take good notes. And uh, you know, for almost any any process, taking really really good notes on what you do, it can be a one step learning curve to just shooting the you know the next beer to, to hitting everything right. Exactly. Well, there you go. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, James. Well, thanks again to Chris. If you want to read Bill Pierce's article, check out the latest issue of BYO. And if you want a free copy, click on the BYO banner ad on our site, basicbrewing.com. And if you decide to subscribe after reading that issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And we appreciate everybody who's done that. Hope to see you in Denver and parts around there. Andy and I are planning to go up to Boulder and Fort Collins and all the usual places while we're in that area of the country. 
So if you see us, flag us down and say howdy. And uh, it should be a great time, as always. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And help me out by spelling your email address right so my reply doesn't go to South Africa. Check out our home brewing DVDs, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits as well. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our shirts, our basic brewing shirts in the store too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are FHI Heat Nano Salon Pro 2000 Professional Salon Hair Dryer with Nano Fusion Technology Black. Sounds cool. Of course, I don't use a hair dryer. I haven't needed a blow dryer since the Clinton administration. Insert your own joke here. Milwaukee Brewers Pet Accessories Kit. Large. Six, six inch, six foot leash collar and ID tag was also ordered through the site. I don't have a joke about that one. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. And don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association through an associate link on basicbrewing.com, along with subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. See you at the Great American Beer Festival, everybody. Bye-bye.